This is lesson number three of C1. This lesson is on incomplete combustion and focuses on experimental work. Our first objective is to explain the conditions which result in incomplete combustion. Our second objective is to be able to construct word and symbol equations to describe incomplete and complete combustion and to analyse trends and patterns and understand how they relate to continuous and discontinuous data. The first part of this lesson is to understand what is combustion. Now combustion is when we burn something and react it with oxygen. So for example, I'm burning methane gas and I've burnt some burner, so this equation, methane plus oxygen, and the two products we get out are carbon dioxide and water. Now at this state, this is what we call the safety flame, okay, the yellow flame. This is what we have on when we're not heating anything. And if you look at the hole over the Bunsen burner, you'll see that it's closed. This is because that we're not allowing an excess of oxygen to mix with the methane and for it to burn. So if I open the hole completely, we get our blue flame and then we get our roaring flame. Now, what we've just gone through is we've started with the safety flame, which is an example of incomplete combustion, going through to complete combustion. And the difference is because with complete combustion, I've opened the hole completely and now there's an excess of oxygen mixing with the methane gas before it burns. If we go back to the safety flame, okay, this is an example of incomplete combustion. So we still have our methane and we react it with oxygen, but because there isn't quite enough to totally react, instead of developing carbon dioxide, we end up with carbon monoxide, so carbon with one oxygen, and carbon and then we get some water. And it is the carbon, as it's in the air, which gives the flame its characteristic yellow colour. If we react it completely in a roaring flame, now we're totally reacting with oxygen and we're just getting carbon dioxide and water. So that is completely reacting. And it's also important to note the hottest part of the flame. So the hottest part of the flame is the tip of the inner blue cone on the inside. So when you're heating something, that's the part that you should use. The rest of the flame above is undergoing complete combustion, and this flame is much hotter with a lot more energy. So what do you need to know? So you need to recognise the difference between complete combustion and incomplete combustion, and you need to be able to write both word equations and the symbol equations. Now these symbol equations have already been balanced for you, um, but it's a good idea for you to understand how they're balanced and why we have these numbers there. You can look at the video about balancing equations to help you do this. So we have methane plus oxygen goes to carbon dioxide and water, so that's complete combustion. In complete combustion we have methane plus oxygen goes to carbon monoxide, carbon and water. So let's have a look at an example of a combustion reaction. So inside here we've got water and fairy liquid. And we're just going to bubble through some methane gas straight from the gas tap. So we're going to make bubbles of pure methane. So we need our ignition source, which in this case is a match. So the methane is inside the bubbles and we're going to react it with the oxygen in the air. So we get a nice combustion reaction and you'll see that because this was a bit of a nice yellow flame, we got quite a lot of incomplete combustion there. Okay, so now we've burnt the methane bubbles in the bowl, but this is science, so we need to make things a little bit more interesting. So let's take it up a step. Now let's set the teachers on fire. So this time, let's see what happens when we burn the methane bubbles in the hand. Okay, so that was good, but we can do one better because this is science. So we need to step it up one more level. So for this part of the demonstration, I need to bring our assistant, Mr. Solo, in. Mr. Solo? Hi, yes, sir. Hello, sir. We've set our hands on fire. Let's do one better. In your lessons, you will have carried out an investigation into which type of flame gives out the most energy. 
and you will have done this by measuring the change in temperature of most probably water. Now, once you've collected your results, we can plot those in different ways. So this section is looking at how we can effectively analyse results. So we have two graphs. Okay? The first is the type of flame against the change in temperature, and the second is the input of oxygen against the change in temperature. Now, these are the same graph. The only thing we've changed is we've changed our independent variable, but we've changed it in terms of what we call discontinuous data and continuous data. So if we were to plan an investigation and our independent, the thing that we change, we were to say is we're going to change the type of flame, which is true, but if we plot a graph like this of discontinuous data, what this means is that the independent values across the bottom have no relationship to each other. This could be yellow flame, blue flame, roaring flame, it could be a green flame, it could be a red flame, but there's no mathematical connection between those. That means that if we look at our three data points that we've got for each flame, although we can clearly see that the roaring flame has a greater change in temperature, we cannot say anything quantitative. So we cannot say, in terms of our trend and pattern, that there is a change between these things. All we can say is we can do a description. So we can say that the yellow flame has the least change in temperature, the blue flame, the middle, the roaring flame, the most. So we can only describe it in very qualitative terms. If we decide to put our data as continuous data, that gives us a lot more options because now we can say something quantitative. So we've decided here to put the input of oxygen, and what we mean by this really is a percentage, and that's the percentage of how open or closed the hole is. So with our yellow flame, the hole is totally closed, we're getting incomplete combustion, um, and we're not adding any extra oxygen. But if we totally open the hole 100%, and we allow that extra input of oxygen, now we can say something quantitative. But before we do that, it's important that we now plot a line of best fit. Now because this data is totally discontinuous, we can't plot a line of best fit. And in fact, it would be just as appropriate for this graph to do it as a bar chart. There's no specific need to do it as a scatter graph. However, with this chart, it's important to do a line of best fit. Now, it's important when you do a line of best fit not to do dot to dot, so not there. The line of best fit should pass smoothly between the points. Now, for this, it's a near linear relationship. So I'm going to choose just for this graph to do a linear line of best fit and it should pass evenly between the points. Now one thing that's important is that you don't go past your data because we don't know what happens here so we can't make any um, assertions about it. So we have to stop and keep it within our data range. And I've not done dot to dot so that might be an accurate line of best fit. There are other ways we could interpret that data but I'm going to choose for this simply to interpret it like that. Now that we've plotted our line of best fit, now we're free to say something far more quantitative about the trend or the pattern in each of these pieces of data. Now for this one, because it's discontinuous, we've already said that we can't describe an, a trend going across, but we can describe it so we can say the difference between each of the flames. This one, however, we can say something far more quantitative. So the way we do this is simple. As the independent increases or decreases, what happens to the dependent, and we structure it in that way. So when we're writing a trend, we can always write it in this format. So we can say as the independent increases, the dependent increases or decreases. So our independent in this investigation was the input of oxygen. So we can say as the input of oxygen increases, going across the graph, the dependent, the change in temperature, if we look at the line, it clearly increases across the graph. So we could say, for our trend for this data, the input of oxygen increases, the change in temperature increases. If our data was the other way, then we could say that it decreases, and we can describe our data more accurately and more quantitatively by using continuous data rather than discontinuous data. So this is an important key step whenever you do an analysis. Number one, to produce a graph that best describes the data and includes all key points, like units, and an appropriate axis and scale, and then using a line of best fit to then create an accurate trend or pattern.